somebody waiting. All right, if you can hear me, wave your, wave your hand if you can hear me. Good deal. Looks like technology is, <clears throat> excuse me, working for us right now. Let me grab some water here. I'm a little froggy today. <clears throat> well, it is good to see you this morning. And um, today, we're actually, for a minute, we're going to go to a theme park. You ready? Well, nice day to go. <clears throat> it is. <laughs> it is. Um, let me ask you a question about that, though. When's the last time that you went to a theme park or the fair where you actually got on a ride of any kind? When was the last time you did that? In the dark ages. A couple of you. Say that again? I said back in the dark ages. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot since then. <laughs> Has anybody gone to one since the year 2000? No. Well, well, park or road, road it's probably been 25 years since I have. 25 years? So that would have been in the 90s. Ferris, I mean, the Ferris wheel. Oh, long. Ferris wheel counts. Absolutely. That's come on with the I like a Ferris wheel. I like a Ferris So let me ask you this. This is another question. Has anybody here ever... Let me ask you this way. Has anybody here never, never ridden a roller coaster? You've never gotten on a roller coaster. Here's one. Brenda said she didn't. I haven't. <laughs> I see three or four of you. I'll tell you what, as soon as things open up, y'all, we need to take this group and get on a bus and go somewhere that has a roller coaster. I <laughs> 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 Oh, and if you've never been on one and you and you would go and ride, I'll buy your ticket to get in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll speak to the log ride. <laughs> well, the log ride is kind of exciting too, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> like a roller coaster with water. It's got hills and valleys. Even though some of you have never been on a roller coaster, I bet you every person in this room has been on a figured roller coaster before, though, uh, through life's experiences, oh, yeah. whether it's so mountaintop experience or a valley experience and maybe there's that rare person in here whose life is just a smooth road all along you you've never you've never had any even little speed bumps but most of us here are probably never experienced that um, you heard the phrase an emotional roller coaster and sometimes um, we can have even on the same day we can have something that happens that brings sadness and also something that happens that brings joy and in one day we may just do like the, the stock market is doing right now. Boom, 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 boom. And just have an, an emotional roller coaster through that. Um, so now, you know, one of you mentioned before we got started here that Jeremiah 20 is a, a tough passage. It's an interesting passage. Um, and, and when you read it, it's, you can actually, if you uh, put yourself back in Jeremiah's day and crawl into his mind and crawl into his heart, you are on the biggest roller coaster ride right now. <laughs> And so we're going to walk through that today to see this, this roller coaster as he, he undergoes, not just emotional, but even a physical roller coaster. He goes through turmoil physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. And so um, let's walk, with that, walk through that today together. So we'll begin at Jeremiah 20 and just read the first six verses and, um, and, and pause at a couple of places to talk about that a little bit. And if I, miss, if I mispronounce this name, please, please forgive me. Some of these names are a little bit unfamiliar all through Jeremiah. Um, so just, just, just forgive me on that. Now, Pasher, the priest, oh, wait, let me give you a context. Remember, Jeremiah had, had, had responded to God and he'd gone to the potter's house, like God told him to, and he purchased a pot. And then he went and he gathered up some of the leaders of the community and some of the leaders of the temple and met, met them outside the gate um, at, at, at the Valley of the Son of, of Hinnom. And there he broke the pot and he explained, this is what God's judgment is for all, Judah and Jerusalem. He explained that. And you can imagine they weren't real thrilled to hear that, although it was not a new message because Jeremiah had been preaching this message, but this time he just had an object lesson to go along with it. So after that, Jeremiah, in the verse at the end of 19, it says that Jeremiah went back in, into the temple area and he began to preach the same message. Um, so that it wasn't just those leaders, but now others began to hear because not every leader came. And my bet is pastor was one of those leaders that didn't meet with, with Jeremiah outside the gate, but 
when Jeremiah came back into the court area, the temple area, he heard this message. That's my guess. So anyway, let's look, read it at Jeremiah 20, verse 1. Now, Pasher, the priest, the son of Emmer, um, who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. So he heard him prophesying these things. And this was apparently back in the temple, um, rather than out of the valley of the son of Hinnom. Pastor the priest was also the chief officer in the temple. So he had a position of authority there. And he would have answered to the high priest himself as a chief officer. And he didn't like what he's hearing. Listen, look in verse two. Then Pasher beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate at the house of the Lord. I'm so thankful that when First Baptist Church doesn't have stocks sitting outside. <laughs> And then there's people here just waiting to beat someone who's preaching the word of God. <laughs> but that's what happens to Jeremiah here. He's preaching what God put on his heart to proclaim the truth. And here the temple official, the temple leader, beat Jeremiah the prophet, put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate at the house of the Lord. Um, what comes to mind when you think of stocks? When you hear stocks here, put them in the stocks. The Puritans. Yeah, me too. The Puritans, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> These big wooden stocks that they have a place for your head and right. a place for your hands. And actually, some of the, some of the theme parks have those too. <laughs> Just even, it really don't put people in it, but you can get in there and actually get out very easily. Um, but mm -hmm. this was not a fun thing for Jeremiah. It was not a theme park at all. Um, it's some sort of scaffold that he was put in. And what they would do is they would, they would twist your body and, and keep it in a, a, an increasingly uncomfortable position the longer that you were in it. And, and you can imagine the fact that this was put in a public place meant that it wasn't just going to cause pain and discomfort, but it was also going to cause shame because everybody that comes by is looking at who is that in the stocks. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if you've ever gotten pulled by a policeman on a road, I wouldn't suggest it. I don't make it a habit to try to do that. But if you've gotten, I remember one time I got pulled when I was 16 years old. And I drove through what I thought was a yellow light at an intersection. Police officer who was parked at the intersection said it was red. And he chased me down. And he, I didn't, he didn't chase me. <laughs> I didn't run from him. As soon as I saw those blue lights, I pulled over. And he came to my car and he got my license and went back to his. But I had some friends who came driving by. Two sets of friends came driving by while I'm pulled over. And I'm sitting there publicly and their, their windows are down. This is in the summer. And they are dying laughing when they come by because they know Ron just got pulled over. And that's, that must have been what it was like uh, for, for anyone that was in the stocks, and particularly Jeremiah, because he had a reputation um, of being a false prophet and being a nut a little bit. And that's, that's actually what the world thinks of Christians sometimes, too. Um, as we follow the Lord, they think, well, you know, you, you're a little whacked out sometimes. But praise the Lord, the Lord knows the truth, and um, and but you can see why these stops were here. You spend the night in the public and you're um, <clears throat> contorted a little bit, so it becomes very uncomfortable. And this is after being beat that Jeremiah experienced this. Later, things will get worse for Jeremiah. Um, believe it or not, he, he would be falsely accused, he'd end up in a, in a prison, and he'd end up in a pit, which we'll read about um, in the future here. But on this night, while Jeremiah is in those stocks while he's contorted and while there's public shame going on sometime during that night god visited jeremiah and, and it, i don't i don't know if it was visual um but god god gave jeremiah a message to proclaim god met with him kind of like he did with paul in a vision back in in acts god was with jeremiah and gave him a special a special message special message for uh, the people of God, but also even a specific message for Pasher. God gave Jeremiah a message to deliver to Pasher. Look in verse 3. The next day, when Pasher released Jeremiah from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord does not call your name Pasher, but terror on every side. That phrase is the name that God identifies Pasher as. Terror on every side. Verse 4, for thus says the Lord, behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. They shall fall by the sword of their enemies while you look on. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. 
Now, this is something interesting that happens right here. You know what happened just then? Yeah. It's the first time that Jeremiah actually names the king of Babylon in the book mm -hmm. of Jeremiah. We know that the, there's a country, uh, invaders from the north. Um, they're actually from the east, but they're coming around from a northern route, uh, kind of a circuit circuitous route. But this is the first time that Jeremiah names the king of Babylon as the invader. And, and very specifically, as God is speaking um, through Jeremiah or giving the message to proclaim, he says, Pastor, all your friends are going to watch, or you're going to watch as they fall by the sword of the enemies. And I will give all of Judah, this is a broad um, prophecy, into the hand of the king of Babylon. Look what he says. And he shall carry them captive to Babylon and shall strike them down with the sword. Moreover, I will give all the wealth of the city, all its gains, all of its prized belongings, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah into the hand of their enemies who shall plunder them and seize them and carry them to Babylon. Now he gets personal um, again. He says, and you, pastor, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. To Babylon you shall go, and there you shall die. There you shall be buried, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied falsely. You know, sometimes across life, you may have wondered, I, I wonder how long I'm going to live. I wonder, I wonder what my circumstances are going to be in my life when I pass away. What's going to be happening there? Well, here, God actually revealed through Jeremiah to Pastor the answer to those questions. Uh, at least maybe not quite as long as you're going to live, but he gave them the circumstances, you and your family. You're going to be taken to, to Babylon, and you'll be in captivity there, and there you shall die. You and to all those that to who you have prophesied falsely. Pastor's um, treatment of Jeremiah would bring consequences to Pastor as well as his family. Remember, Pastor didn't believe Jeremiah to begin with. That's why he became so angry. So even when Jeremiah is proclaiming this personal message, it wouldn't be surprising to me if Pastor mostly disregarded or completely disregarded this message from, from Jeremiah as well. But because people don't listen to God's truth does not change the truthfulness of God, of his message, of his word. God's truth is always the same. There's not a single promise that God makes that will go unfulfilled. His truth is forever. And um, be encouraged by that because sometimes when we look around and things happen, we're thinking, we may think, Lord, I know your word says this, but it seems like this is happening. And I can't reconcile the two. Well, Jeremiah, you can see right here, he's in that setting because when you read the rest of 20, he knows what God promised. And yet these things are happening. And so he actually even has an accusation about God that, that is experience based at the moment, that's feelings based at the moment that actually is not true of God, but it feels like it is. It feels like God's abandoned him. And we'll, we'll get there in just a second. But right here, Pastor's end has been pronounced by God uh, through Jeremiah. He'll die. He'll be buried in Babylon. And this is not a good thing for a, for a Jewish person to be buried outside of the Jewish homeland in this day. It was, it was a curse. And, and, and he would be buried in a, Pastor would be buried in a Gentile land. And that was seen as a curse. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if the place that you grew up your, your little town or your big town, you had you had another town that was perceived as them, you know, us and them. I know I grew up in Apex, and our big rivals when I was a teenager was Cary. Our biggest rival was Cary. Um, not just sports. There seemed to be an attitude. If you were from Apex, oh, you're from Cary. Oh, you're, you're one of them. Um, and they had the same attitude. Many of them had the same attitude towards Apex. This is different, though. This is a land that God gave to the Jewish people, it was God, the Jewish people were God's people. One day the Gentiles would be grafted in, which, which we've seen God even prophesied that um, through the prophecies of, of Jeremiah here at the beginning. Um, but here the pastor was, was basically receiving a curse that he would be buried in a Gentile land, he and his friends. Um, Time-wise too, if the events that we read about in this chapter um, and the previous two chapters happened during Jehoiakim's reign, King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, then it didn't take long for these prophecies to come to pass. Um, I've jotted down a couple of dates here. And in 605, 
Uh -huh. Nebuchadnezzar plundered the temple. That's the king of Babylon came and plundered the temple in 605 and took Jehoiakim, who was the king. That's 605, took Jehoiakim and the nobles to Babylon. We're going to read about him later because he was, he was actually in captivity there by uh, Nebuchadnezzar and late in his life, and he was actually released, but kept there in Babylon. Interesting, um, which Jeremiah will talk about towards the end of Jeremiah. In 597, though, in, um, Nebuchadnezzar also took 10,000 people. That was, let's see, that's what, eight years later, he came and took more people. So this, this deportation was a, was a long process. And then 11 years later, he burned the temple in Jerusalem and left it in ruins. That was in 586 BC. Um, and then even years after that, five years after that, he deported another group of exiles. So the prophecy that Jeremiah is proclaiming here, um, it wasn't something that may happen 100 years down the road or 50 years down the road. It was going to be happening um, relatively soon. If this is if this is happening in these chapters around Jehoiakim's reign, but right now is where J chapter twenty changes gears. Um, all of a sudden, it's like we move from from that scenario with Pasher and, and Jeremiah being in the stocks to um, Jeremiah's almost like his personal journal. We're in, we're given the opportunity to see an, a conversation, a prayer that um, that Jeremiah brought to the Lord. He'd experienced this physical roller coaster in a sense and this turmoil. But now there's some things that are happening that he brings him to, to lament, to cry out to God in this. So let's, let's look at this. You'll see um, grief and joy. Um, there's prayer, there's despair, um, there's praise, there's bewilderment. But it starts off with Jeremiah just laying his heart out in a very raw way because, y'all, God, God's not surprised by anything we say. <laughs> I know sometimes we can pray. We were talking, joking a little bit before the study with some of you that, you know, Jeremiah is one that he doesn't sugarcoat things. He doesn't speak with tact about things. Um, he just, he lays out the truth. He lays it out there. Right now he's before God and he's just laying out there what God already knows um, with his emotions and with his feelings and with his thoughts and trying to reconcile God's promises and yet these terrible circumstances. So let's look what he says in this, in this cry of anguish beginning in verse 7. Look at this accusation at the very beginning. Oh, Lord, you have deceived me. <laughs> what does it mean to be deceived? Well, it means somebody told you something that actually was not true. And so he has this, this, this sense, this feeling that there's no way I can make sense of this unless you have deceived me. So that's what he says. Oh, Lord, you have deceived me. And I was deceived. You are stronger than I. And you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. It mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. For the Lord, the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all the day long. You can see why he feels like there's deception that's going on on God's part um, because of all the circumstances that he's in, and people are making a, a mockery of, of Jeremiah and the message that Jeremiah's proclaiming. Now I'm asking you to do something to skip over verse nine for just for a second. And look at verse 10, because this is a thought that continues right there. He says, for I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> That's the name of pasture that God says. But they're identifying Jeremiah with this as well. He says, denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, and then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. They're talking about Jeremiah. And that what their thoughts are towards Jeremiah as a person, and also Jeremiah in his ministry as, um, as someone who they see as a false prophet and a foolish prophet, and proclaim, claiming things that, that aren't true. In their minds, they weren't true. There's a, there's a, a truth in this, isn't it? And that's a truth that I know many of you have experienced, probably, I'm guessing many of you, and, and certainly Christians across decades and, and centuries and, and generations have experienced and that is sometimes even when we serve God sometimes um, there are, are, are troubles that we face because that we of us serving God when we serve God faithfully when we follow God faithfully when we live by his word it, it can actually bring difficulty and trouble in our lives as a follower of Christ you don't, you're not receiving this trouble. You're not experiencing this trouble because of your unfaithfulness, but because of your faithfulness. 
because not everybody understands. Now, I don't know that there's anybody here that spent last night in the stocks, but I do know that in, in our lifetimes, for us, we, we have, relatively speaking, America is, has been a safe, safer place or an easier place to proclaim the gospel. But there are some folks last night who spent the night in stocks or spent the night in prison or who are because of their faith in Christ across this world. There, there's Christians today, brothers and sisters, who are experiencing terrible things because of faithfulness. And we need to pray for the persecuted church. And I hope that's one thing um, that just said at right now is a reminder to pray for the persecuted church because um, it's easy not to, not to uh, because we don't know much, we just know a little, it's easy to think, well, God, I'm going to pray for them and um, please help them. But I would ask that you, you spend time um, calling out to the Lord uh, for their, their well-being. And it may, and that may not mean out of prison, but it could but also for the gospel to be proclaimed because even through their persecution there, many times there's people that are coming to know Christ. Even some of their persecutors have come to know Christ. Um, anyway, I, I just, just know that for, you don't have to be a vocational minister to understand that when you follow God faithfully, it can lead to difficulties. It can lead to challenges. That's for every believer. Jesus. I mean, there's all, when you read scripture, there's a promise of suffering when we follow Christ. And um, so this expectation of following Jesus means I'm going to have a life of ease. I'm going to have a life of comfort. No, 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 no. That's the opposite of what God's word teaches. Look in Hebrews 11 and you'll see, um, we know it as the, the hall of faith. There's people that are pointed out who they saw tremendous victory because of their faith. But then it goes in there, um, the writer of Hebrews goes and, and mentions others who suffered and had to live in caves and, and, and were persecuted and some sawed in half because of their faith. And so um, here, Jeremiah, he's saying, Lord, these things are terrible. You've deceived me. You deceived me. And now I'm nothing but a, a public shame because I've been faithful to the message and following you. He feels like, God, you, you lied to me. Now, let me ask you a question. Did God lie to Jeremiah? No, don't you think there was a period of time between verses, you know, uh, the between verses uh, six and seven? Uh, uh, Could very well have been. Yeah, that he was worn down. I mean, Jeremiah was human, just like you and I are. And you said, well, Lord, I've been doing this and I've been doing this and things are, aren't getting any better. And so I, I'm just tired of, you know, yes, that we forget sometimes that the prophets were human, just like you and I are. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you, you get worried with God. God, are you there? Is it, yes. you know, is my prayers going no farther than, you know, the ceiling? And I think, I think there was a series of time between, uh, that he was just worn down here. That's the only thing that I can figure out that he had, you know, he wanted God to, to show his face, you know, yeah. do something. Yeah. yeah. You know, sometimes we just want to say, God, do something. Just do something. <laughs> well, you're probably right because, um, you know, one of the things we talked about at the beginning of Jeremiah is that this is not a, a chronological story. Yeah. There are some things that do kind of take place in a chronological order, but a lot of this is a compilation mm -hmm. that a scribe put together a, a mixture of historical events and then Jeremiah's own writings or his own message that God proclaimed. Um, like when we get to the next chapter, chapter 21, it looks like there may be a 20-year gap between 20, chapter 20 and chapter 21, somewhere yeah. about 20 years. And so, yes, you're right. There may be a difference in the time that's here. And, and we are getting a piece of Jeremiah's thoughts that may not be directly connected to Pasher, but it's connected to the whole ministry. Um, yeah. But it could be connected to Pasher, but it may not be. You're right. He, you can imagine he's, he is just worn down. And whether it's Pasher or, or something else, there's a straw that broke <laughs> the camel's back. Yeah. And, it's his heart, and he's just laying this out to the Lord. You're right. It may be. That's a good insight. But one thing we do know is that God did not lie to Jeremiah, although it felt like it at the time. In that moment, 
sometimes our experience speaks louder than anything else in our lives, doesn't it? Yes. What we feel right now can be the loudest voice that we hear right now. And that's why we have to marinate ourselves in God's word. And, and sometimes it's, it's actually very helpful to um, compartmentalize what's going on in my life right now so that I can set it aside just for, just for a while and come to the Lord. And so, knowing I have to deal with that later, but Lord, I can feel my perspective being changed. I need your spirit. I need your word to, to, to stay my heart right now. So that I can address that and I can, I can address that issue in light of truth and not address truth in light of my circumstances. And it's, I it's think a, Jim, I wanted reassurance from God. I mean, he was pouring out his heart. He, he was mad. <laughs> yeah. he said, but he still believed it. He didn't believe. He just yeah. wanted some reassurance, I think, from God. Yeah, he's like we do. Just exactly right. I was going to say, he's not any different than us. I actually have that in my notes to mention a little bit. He's, he's 100% human yeah. and 0% superhuman. Yeah. It's not that him or any of the Old Testament prophets or, or, or New Testament um, disciples, you know, it's not like they, well, they have something we don't. It's the same God and God calls us to be faithful. And, um, and so Jeremiah had a call on his life. And I mentioned, I jotted down a couple of verses, what God did tell Jeremiah at the very beginning of Jeremiah, we read this. This is Jeremiah 1.5. This is the Lord speaking to Jeremiah about his call. Look what he says. Before I formed you in the womb, you remember this? Yeah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So that sounds reasonable. God called Jeremiah. God had a purpose and a plan for Jeremiah before Jeremiah even was, was even born. But then in verse seven of chapter one, it says, don't, don't Jeremiah wanted to push back because he was so young when he, when he heard this from the Lord, but God, verse seven says, do not say I'm only a youth for to all whom I send you, you shall go. This is what God tells Jeremiah early on for all who, to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Look what he says. Don't be afraid of them, for I am with you. Uh, excuse me, I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. But he also, in that same call, he, he expresses there's going to be hard times that are coming. Not everybody's going to receive your message because in verse 18 of chapter 1, I said, and, and I behold, I make you this day a fortified city and, an and, a bronze, and bronze walls against the whole land against the kings of Judah, its officials and its priests and the people of the land. Now listen to this next part. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Very early on, God told him, Jeremiah, you are going to go through hard times. And all those community leaders, all those kings and, and religious leaders, they are, you're not going to win any friends from them. They're going to fight you. They're going to actively oppose you. Boy, did they. And yet, God says, but I am with you. And so when, and I think when we're reading some of this, this and, and the, after verse 6, starting at verse 7, we read Jeremiah's heart, that we start to see uh, <coughs> fighting become a loud voice in his mind. It's like, wait, where's God? But when we go back to the beginning, God hadn't left. God's still there. And this roller coaster is, is of of. of Events and, and emotional and mental turmoil, uh, we can see Jeremiah doing this right here. And right now, he's low in this in this emotional valley. And, and all of us are capable of being. But look what happens in verse 9, because all of a sudden, we see this roller coaster rolling back up again. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name. If I say, I am done with you, God. I'm not following you anymore to, to, to do what you call me to do. Look what he says. There is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. God had placed his burning message in, in Jeremiah's heart that there was no way he was going to be able to stop doing that. Even though his mind wasn't saying, I'm going to quit. He couldn't. He couldn't. Because he had a message that God had put in his heart in the presence of the Lord with him. And he had a message and God had put in his heart and a fire in his bones. And so Jeremiah, he didn't preach because he just had to say something. <laughs> he preached because he had something to say. 
He, he had a message that God had put in his heart. Kind of like Paul said in 1 Corinthians when he said, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Jeremiah is saying, woe to me if I, if I choose not to, to preach this. I've got to, I've got to proclaim your message, God. And so you can see Jeremiah starts to be kind of um, refreshed at the moment as in this process um, that he's going through in this roller coaster that he's on. And then considering God's call on his life, um, he's being refreshed and he looks away from himself, which is, which is a blessing y'all sometimes when we do, especially when we start to get in that pity party, you know, and we want it, we really just want, oh man, woe is me for my circumstances. He looks, begins to look it away from himself and he, and consider his the enemies, the ones that are giving them a hard time. And so this mood that he's in or this uh, frame of mind that he's in goes from expressing courage, actually, even to seeking revenge, which belongs to the Lord, then just does, and then to rejoicing in worship. He, he ends up landing at a place for a moment anyway um, that he's worshiped. So he, his thoughts are all over the place here. His mind and heart are all over the place. But look at verse 11. Listen to this little journey that he's in. But the Lord is with me. Aren't you glad he said that? Aren't you glad he recognized that at the moment? He said, the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. And that's talking about a warrior that causes fear. I mean, he's a fierce warrior. And therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed. They will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. The Lord of hosts who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For you, to you I have committed my cause. And then in verse 13, he says, sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. It's almost like, like Jeremiah did write this down in his journal and then um, and now we're having a glimpse into in what was going on. And, and at some point, if Jeremiah had ripped this out and we never saw this, we'd be missing something. Because, um, because he's, he's writing and um, through an experience that we all can resonate with. It's almost like reading some of the Psalms, isn't it? When you read some of the Psalms, there's praises and all of a sudden there's, there's an appeal to God. God, where are you? You're not here. Where are you? And the Lord is there, but there's appeal to him because it seems like he's not. Jeremiah is, um, he's, a, he's a, a human just like we are. Um, I saw this list, and I'm going to share it with you real quick. You know, as we, as we consider Jeremiah seemingly going from, I don't, I don't want to believe you anymore, God, to, oh, God, you are, you are worthy of my praise. Um, it, it kind of shows that Jeremiah is a broken person, just like we are. He's, he's not superhuman. You know, God didn't look at Jeremiah and say, wow, that guy can really speak. I'm going to draft him to my team. <laughs> Sometimes we can put Christians on a pedestal, certain Christians, and say, wow, I wish I was more like them. Then God could really use me. No, 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 no. That's not the way God works. He's not trying to draft a fantasy ministry team. He's not trying to draft a fantasy church. He's, he's seeking to call people um, who are available. You've heard that before. It's not our ability. It's our availability. That when we come to the Lord in faith, he uses us. And it may be on a platform or it may be, Back where nobody even sees, but God sees and God knows and God gets glory. He gets glory from every bit of any time that we are faithful to the Lord. He, his name is glorified. Scripture reveals all, all people are broken and that God uses broken people. Listen, to this. this is really quick, um, but it's a, long, it's a long list, but it's really quick because each one is short. Noah, all these people are broken people that God used in all of Scripture. Not all the people listed in Scripture, but each one of these is in Scripture. Noah got drunk. God still used him. Noah got drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob lied. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused back in Genesis. Moses was a murderer and couldn't talk clearly. Gideon, well, he was a coward. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Did y'all know that? Mm. Isaiah 20. Check it out sometime. Thank goodness there's not pictures, but Isaiah preached naked at some point. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples, they fell asleep while praying. 
Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene was demon possessed. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Timothy had stomach problems. Zacchaeus, he was too short. Paul was a murderer, or at least, at the very least, an accomplice to murder. And Lazarus, well, he was dead. <laughs> God used broken people, ordinary people, in extraordinary ways because we have a God. I don't want to say he's an extraordinary God, extraordinary meaning extraordinary, but there is no ordinary God. There's false gods, and there's one true God. And so the one true God uses ordinary people when we're obedient to accomplish his purposes, just as he is doing in, in Jeremiah's life. He didn't have superpowers. But he had a, a super God, the one true God. So um, when the going got tough, it was almost too tough here for, the, the t um, for Jeremiah to get going. <coughs> but he wasn't on his own. He, was, he <coughs> had the presence of the Lord. And even though he felt like he was alone at times, he cried out to God, and we can do the same thing. Maybe there's times when you experience that as well. Lord, I just, I don't know how I can go another day. If life was hard before 2020 came, all 2020 did maybe is just stoke the flames of hardness and, and, and loneliness and despair. And just, I mean, so many things that people are, are experiencing that are elevated um, and elevated negativity if we allow that to take place. But God is not, he's not, he's not minimized at all by a pandemic. He's, he is faithful and he's the same. He's the same God today that he was in 2020 and 2019. And he's the same God he's always been and always will be. So there's nothing that we face that we, we end up, we can actually end up accurately saying, God, you, you're not powerful. Because that's not accurate. He's all powerful. God, you're not here. It's not true. He's always here. And God, you're, you're just not aware of my circumstances. That's not true either. He, he is omniscient. He knows everything. He's the same God. And so although we may go through emotional, spiritual roller coasters ourselves, just know we have a God who is a rock. And he's always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I can, I can place my faith in God through Christ. I can place my faith in Jesus. Or I can place my faith in my reasoning and circumstances and experience. And that's where it's going to lead me. It's going to lead me to despair. Um, in fact, let's, let's finish out Jeremiah 20 here. Because that's where that's where he ends up in this passage. You know, we want to, we will actually we want a story to end that everybody lives happily ever after, right? We want we want good conclusions to to not just whole stories, but even the chapters. We're not going to end up in a good place here, uh, but we are ending up at a real place. Uh, so I guess that is a good place. Jeremiah is pouring out his heart to God again. So this roller coaster is going like this, and now it drops back down to the bottom again. Listen to what he says. He was praising God in one in one breath, and the next breath. Um, he starts cursing his own birthday. Here my 20, 14 through 18, our last section here. Um, Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day which, when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Jewish parents would rejoice when they, um, when they, at the birth of any child, but especially the birth of a son at that time, because it was a patriarchal system. And that meant there was going to, the family name was going to be carried on. Um, and so there was a, a joy that they, they found in that. And so Jeremiah is saying, cursed is that man who came and told my dad, you know, they didn't have ultrasounds. Is this going to be a boy or a girl? <laughs> so when, when, when Jeremiah was born, the messenger came and told Jeremiah's father, you got a son. Um, he said, curse, Jeremiah says, curse is the man that brought this news to my dad and made my dad glad over that. Uh, these sons also were the retirement plans for their, their, for their parents. Um, and so when they had a son, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be taken care of in my old age. <laughs> um, because the patriarchal system set it up that way, um, that, that it was a responsibility for sons to, to take care of their parents in their old age. Um, I will tell you, you know this, if you're a parent, whether it's a boy or girl, I trust you're just as thrilled. <laughs> I was just as thrilled with Aiden Austin and Caleb as I was with Whitley. And, um, so, uh, but in that day, this is what Jeremiah was referring to. But he also, he feels so much despair that he says this messenger that delivered the news should be treated like Solomon the He says that person should be cursed. 
Verse 14, let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning, morning and an alarm in the afternoon, and, 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 and if I'm a messenger, because he did not kill me in the womb, so as my mother would have been in my grave, and her womb forever grave. Why did I come out from the womb to see soil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? Do what? You're gargling. I am. Has it been that way for a while? Yeah. Oh, How about that? Is that better? That's better. Yeah. Have I gargled through this whole Bible study? No, 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 no. The last Just, minute or two. I understood you. Last <laughs> few verses. You well, have wrong mouth, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the heads up. There's one setting on my microphone here that I have to make sure is in place, and I forgot to check it today. So sometimes I don't know why it'll switch over to where I'm from another planet. It's crazy. <laughs> Um, you, you can see Jeremiah he seemed at one point he's praising the Lord and all of a sudden he's in the pit of despair again and and there's a grief that he's experiencing there's a grief in all of this and, and that's the way grief works sometimes isn't it we can, we can really be in a good place and, and be fine and the next moment like a kick in the gut grief just overwhelms us and that's, that's kind of what Jeremiah seems to be experiencing here um, I know nobody here is a stranger to grief. Um, and, and I just remember when my dad died, I was so thankful. My first words, I didn't even choose to say them, but it escaped my mouth around my dad's bed there in the hospital when he passed away was, thank you, Jesus, because I knew he was with the Lord. Mm-hmm. But then that later on, you know, even days or weeks follow. I'm driving down Timber Road or something here in Garner, and all of a sudden there may be just one thing that triggers a memory of dad, you know, and, and it's like all of a sudden I'm just, I'm ready to pull over and get in the fetal position on the ground somewhere and just wail. And then it'll pass. And sometimes it didn't even have to have a trigger. It just would happen. And yet there's a truth out there that grief doesn't necessarily acknowledge all the time. And that's why we can grieve with joy. The truth is the joy that, that Jesus um, is, is with us now. And there's a perspective that's greater than what our grief would, pro- grief would proclaim at that time. And so Jeremiah ends up right here in a pit of despair. Um, and he said, I, I, I'd have been better off. The world would be better off if I wasn't even born. So this one, this chapter doesn't necessarily end with a happy, ever, happily ever after. But it does end at this point with a grieving prophet on a roller coaster who's experienced highs of praise and the valleys of despair. But it does point, this chapter does point to a God who is faithful and is with him, whether Jeremiah recognizes it this moment and not this moment, that God is still with him. And even though he doesn't understand why God's allowing him to suffer, he's worthy of praise. He's the ultimate judge. He's also Jeremiah's defender, as he promised to be. And at some point, it will be resolved. And, and, and Jeremiah can continue to be, to be faithful to God's call. And so um, we're going to see Jeremiah get past this moment for now, but he's going to enter some more pits of despair um, as, we, as we walk through the rest of Jeremiah. But just know our God is faithful and we can trust him, even when it seems like everything um, within us wants to say, no, you can't, no, you can't. Well, yes, you can. His truth is far greater than our own, our own voice and thoughts. He is good. And he's faithful. I'm going to end with that. God is good and he's faithful all the time. He's good and faithful. Let me ask you, do you have any um, anything you want to share? Any observations or takeaways? Thankful for the sunshine. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Well, y'all are a blessing. Let me close us our time together in prayer and, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. Father, thank you so much that you are good and faithful. And Lord, there's a lot in this chapter um, that really connects with our own lives in in a a way that highlights the fact that we are broken people. We have emotions, we have um, experiences. And uh, Lord, they're all over the place sometimes just because of how we're we're wired to react. 
the circumstances around us. But Lord, I'm so thankful that in Christ, you transform our hearts. In Christ, we can know that we have a God who is steady, who's the same. You're stable, Lord. And it doesn't matter how upside down the world around us can get or our lives can get, Lord. You're the same and we can cling to you. We may cry out to you, Lord, just like Jeremiah did. Father, in those moments, I pray that your spirit and your word would simply break through with truth. It may be a small whisper, but help our hearts to hear that whisper and then to turn towards you and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you through this. I'm going to depend on you because you are faithful. And on this roller coaster, Lord, I know I'm not alone because you're with me. And I'm so grateful. Thank you so much, Lord, for our, our time together today. And Lord, may your spirit bring <coughs> to mind this week. Uh, your word as we read it and as we build our lives upon it and as we uh, bask in the, in the joy and the presence of our Savior. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ron. Such Thank a blessing. You, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Love Thank you guys. Y'all have a great week and we'll see you. you. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Uh, can ask, Ron, can I ask you a question? Sure. Has, has the new literature come in? It has. New literature is here. In fact, I got a text last night that's saying it's ready um, either to be picked up or I'll be glad to bring it to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later about how. Okay. To do it. okay. All right. Sounds good. Just give me a call. Okay. All right. We'll see you. Love you guys. Bye. Bye.